So welcome everyone to our webinar. I'm really excited for this uh, panel and uh, to have everyone here uh, thinking about what we need in terms of equitable and sustainable jobs when we're talking about poverty. Um, in promoting this event, we often talked about how as anti-poverty advocates, we hear that people just need to get a job. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about what kind of jobs um, and recognize that jobs are not the answer to everyone. Um, but for those who, uh, who can and choose to work, um, there are certain things that we wanna keep in mind when we're thinking about what, uh, what sort of standards we need for, for work, uh, what sort of regulations are needed, what opportunities are needed, and how can we do that in a way that is also sustainable as we think about not just uh, addressing the uh, pandemic and the crisis of poverty in our country, but as we also think about uh, transitioning to a green economy um, to respond to the, to the climate crisis as well. So I am going to uh, say thanks for being here and I'm going to turn it over to Emily Renault, who is our moderator today with Canada Without Poverty. And, um, and then you'll hear some more from me at the end, a little bit more about our Chew on This campaign, which this webinar is, um, is associated with. So welcome and, uh, and enjoy. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Emily. I am uh, sort of tuning in today from the unceded territory of the Algonquin. Uh, so the Algonquin um, tribe is, I have some ancestry there. So these are very sacred lands to both my family and, and a lot of the residents in this, um, on these lands. And uh, with these Zoom meetings, everyone is tuning in from across the, from across the country. So just acknowledging the, sort of the sisters and brothers and people who really founded these lands and have cultivated them for thousands of years. Um, so uh, as Natalie said, my name is Emily. I'm the National Coordinator of Canada Without Poverty. And uh, excitingly, this is my first Chew on This campaign that I'm sort of participating in and attending. Uh, so I hope a lot of you have been able to attend some of the other webinars as they're happening all week. Um, today, we're bringing together the conversation of employment equity and sustainable jobs, as Natalie's already given the background or two. So our panelists today consist of Shalini, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing your last name wrong, but Kananor. Okay, uh, Shalini Kananor, who is the lawyer and executive director of the South, <clears throat> sorry, Southeast Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario. We're also joined by Carmen Ramirez, who is a PhD candidate in practical theology at the St. Thomas University and Ian Wilson, who is a board member of the Keepers of Athabasca, I think that's how it's pronounced, um, and he brings uh, an extensive experience both working in the oil and gas industry and uh, his previous role with um, Iron and Earth in the creation of sustainable jobs and the retraining from um, oil and gas industry to sustainable jobs. So I will let each panelist introduce themselves a little bit more, uh, give us as much background on their work experience as they want, and, uh, and tell everyone a little bit about what brings them to this webinar today. And we're going to talk, uh, sorry, we're going to start with Shalini. Shal Shal Thank you so much, Emily. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm in Richmond Hill. Uh, and I do want to start as well by saying that I'm on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabeg Nations, as well as the Mississaugas of the new Credit First Nation. Uh, I'm very thankful to be here. Uh, so my name is Shalini Koninor. I'm a lawyer and the executive director of a legal clinic in Ontario called the South Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario. And before that, I've actually been in the clinic system for the past 20 years here in Ontario. So my work has primarily focused on working with low income racialized communities. And um, we do a lot of direct legal service with clients. So I work with workers on the ground on their direct day-to-day -day work. And what that allows um, me to do is start to think about the larger ways in which the system is failing these different communities and the advocacy and law reform that we may need to do. And one of the biggest projects that I am part of is a campaign called the Color of Poverty, Color of Change campaign. And I encourage you, if you have the chance, to just Google Color of Poverty, their website will come up. And we released actually this past year a series of fact sheets 
Uh, and those fact sheets really look at the data across Ontario and across Canada around how uh, racialized communities are faring in terms of their outcomes. And that brings me to this work. The reason that I do a lot of work in labor and employment law is because we know from the data at Color Poverty and the work that we do that racialized communities, um, Black communities, Indigenous communities just have significantly um, disparate outcomes in labor market across the board. So in terms of wage gaps, in terms of unemployment rates, in terms of promotion rates, in terms of access to certain parts of the labor market, they are still doing poorly. And one of the things that's really interesting about the conversation is that uh, when we speak in particular to government stakeholders, they sort of always phrase this as a newcomer and an immigrant experience, that they're newer to the country, and so it takes time. But what we know now, because we have enough data, is that this is a generational issue. And in fact, racialized communities from different generations are still experiencing those disparities. So the other piece that I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more and others will talk about is that we work with a large population of people with either no immigration status or precarious immigration status. And their experience of the labor market in Canada and the other supports to alleviate poverty is quite different um, and, and even more troubling in probably one of the most vulnerable groups in terms of employment. And so that's a piece that's always um, really important to me because I see it every day in my, um, in my work with clients. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's go to Carmen now. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmen Ramirez and I am on the traditional territory of Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. I am a, currently I am a PhD candidate and I also work with Phil, the Forum of Intercultural Leadership and Learning since 2012, specifically with the Deepening Understanding for Intercultural Ministries program. I am also a part of uh, the Phil reference group. I also facilitate racial uh, justice workshop for the United Church of Canada. And I was invited to this webinar because with Phil, we train uh, to understand, to help, accept, and love those who do not look like us. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Ian. Uh, hi there, it's Ian Wilson. I'm in uh, Treaty 6 territory in uh, Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, with Keepers of the Athabasca board member for that organization, and they are uh, an environmental group that uh, focuses on the Athabasca River all the way from the uh, Columbia ice fields to the uh, Athabasca, or sorry, to Lake Athabasca. And, uh, you know, so we focus on anything to do with the environment, uh, climate change, if there's any um, uh, oil and gas mines or, or coal mines or anything like that in the region that could uh, negatively affect that uh, watershed, then we, we sort of have a lot of interest in that. So uh, I have a background about 20 years or so as a fossil fuel worker. So I guess I've, I've gone from being the, uh, the evil oil and gas guy to almost the environmentalist now, I guess. But um, anyhow, that's me. And uh, I'm here to talk about uh, uh, oil and gas workers and just workers in general that will, will have to help facilitate this transition to, to the low carbon economy. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I think I'll now pose some general questions that each panelist can uh, take a minute or two to answer. Um, so these questions will be very general just uh, based on our theme and then we'll move towards some individualized questions for each of our panelists and then uh, the audience can have uh, a chance to ask some questions as well. So starting with the general questions, so as Natalie said, uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people, the general public tends tends to hold the attitude that if you're poor or homeless, the solution is really just to get a job. And uh, in the, this webinar hopes to highlight the barriers to the to the labor market that a lot of people have uh, who are low income, impoverished, homeless. Can each of you, based off of your fields of work and your own experience and your knowledge and lived experience, uh, speak to these barriers and uh, 
to the people, sorry, speak to these barriers that people in your communities face and anyone can start. Sure, I can start. <laughs> um, well, by experience, one of the main, I think, barriers that occur with the people that I work with and in my own community um, is racism. Um, then the next one would be um, that if they are hired to take a, any job, it's usually a low paying job. And so these are, I think, two of the strongest um, issues that, that occur within, within the community. I can go uh, next. Um, so at the top of my list, as Carmen said, was racism and discrimination. Um, and uh, when I say racism and discrimination, I don't, I don't, I think uh, when I talk to a lot of people, they kind of see it as this very individual thing. But in fact, I think the barriers for a lot of the communities I'm working with are much more systemic. So systemic pieces of racism and discrimination that are built into the labor market, assumptions that are made about uh, certain communities that really hold them back from either getting into good paying jobs or even being promoted when they're in a good paying job. And I think we have a real issue there. The other piece um, that is harder to tackle is the immigration status piece. So across Canada, we are moving to systems of immigration that are creating these large workforces of temporary foreign workers, migrant workers, undocumented workers, international students who are allowed to work. And because of the precarity of their immigration status, that actually gives them precarity in their employment. They're subject to so much more abuse. And the reality is when you don't have standing in terms of being safe in your immigration status, it's very hard to assert employment rights. Um, by way of example, I tell people that about two years ago, I worked with a series of factory workers in Brampton, all who were undocumented, who were being paid $3 an hour. This is in 2018, right? And they were not going to do anything about it because the risk to them of potentially being removed from Canada was far greater. And so we have to, I think, start thinking about what do we do for these populations. The other piece I have on my list is foreign credential recognition. And a number of the clients that we work with and a number of my colleagues, in fact, have come to Canada from other places. And I've seen firsthand the difficulty in getting those credentials recognized and what that does to the labor market outcomes for those clients and those families that they have to take, like Carmen said, low paying, low wage jobs, even though they are eminently qualified and their skills are needed. They actually come based on skill by immigration, only to find out then that that skill is not going to be recognized here. And the last barrier that I have been thinking about is the intersectional piece, right? So when we talk about these communities, those that identify uh, along different gender lines, different ability lines, have even deeper disparities in terms of the barriers. The gender race wage gap is much more significant than the race wage gap on its own. I guess that leaves me. Um, I've noticed in, in my line of work over the last uh, several years, I guess, and I, I'm talking about my, my work as a, as a fossil fuel worker, I guess. Um, I believe that the, the Liberal government's uh, GBA plus uh, budgeting has, has, I've really noticed that take effect in, in the workplace because I have seen uh, an increase in uh, diversity in, in the workplace. There's a lot of uh, workers that would work alongside me that are from uh, foreign countries, um, obviously not Canada. So um, one of the barriers that I see with that is, is you do see quite a lot of uh, workers that are quite skilled, uh, which, is, which is really good. And uh, um, you'd mentioned, Shalani, that, that there are issues with uh, uh, rec equalization or I guess, I, I can't remember how you worded it, but, but uh, skills transfer equalization um, uh, recognition, I guess, right? 
and uh, so there are there are a, a lot of uh, very good workers that come from other countries that that I've worked with in the past, but um, the the barriers sometimes can be cultural, and also language barriers play a role sometimes, uh, which is which is unfortunate. So um, those are are basically the barriers. But I mean, there we we do our best to work around them in the industry and things like that. And uh, but yeah, the, it's definitely a barrier. There, there are some barriers there, but I, I do see a lot of workers that are, um, you know, benefiting from that GPA, GBA plus um, budgeting. I've worked with transgender workers in the workplace and things like that. And uh, I will admit there, there may be a degree of uh, maybe discrimination or that sort of thing. But uh, the, most of the places where I've worked are very, very professional and they address it in the best way possible and uh, to minimize those sorts of things. So that's nice to see, but uh, I mean, we can always do better, right? So. Thank you everyone. Uh, so now I'm going to pose some questions to each panelist. So I'll start with Ian. Uh, so often those living in poverty, working in blue collar jobs in indigenous communities who are living paycheck to paycheck might find it um, challenging to think about retraining or reforming their industry and investing in these future climate change initiatives, which would involve them sort of transitioning to, to the more sustainable jobs. Um, how would you say we approach these challenges and the retraining programs for workers in the oil and gas industry um, in, in your communities? Well, uh, Keepers of the Athabasca is an Indigenous-led organization. It does have, you know, a few non-Indigenous people in it. I'm one of them. Um, so I can address that question, I guess, on two fronts, I suppose. Um, the, the oil and gas workers um, that, you know, people talk about, it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting to see this, this transition. I mean, a few years ago, we had uh, the same sort of issue in... Uh, in the in the maritimes right because they had uh, uh, a shortage of fish and so people that fished for generations you know their grandfather and great-grandfather were fishermen they had to do different things and in a lot of cases those people's those people from the east coast found themselves in the oil and gas industry here in alberta and uh so what's what's happening now is that industry um seems to be uh, I won't say it's in a decline. I, you know, I don't know the right, the right phrasing because people look at it differently, but um, it's definitely not uh, expanding or booming at this particular time. And so what we're looking at is we have to sort of um, qualify what, what a clean energy job is or what a green worker is, because um, you can't really sit there and there's there's not equivalent uh, jobs in the green industry that there would be in the oil and gas industry, but there's not really, honestly, that much retraining that needs to be done. Uh, the reason is most of the most of the workforce is is highly skilled already. They're electricians, welders, pipe fitters, uh, you know, crane operators, that kind of thing, and they're already skilled tradespeople. So to actually make the transition from working on a you know, a refinery or something like that to say a solar farm or a wind farm or something like that, you're still using the skills that you've learned, but they're just in a, in a slightly different way. I mean, electricity is electricity. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of long and short of it. There is, there is a lot of opportunity in terms of uh, building up the infrastructure, you know, because if you're, if you have solar, say, for example, on all, all the residential roofs, you have to boost up the the uh, power lines because uh, it's going to carry the voltage in both directions kind of thing or the current or what have you. And so there is, there is opportunity for those things to, to increase. Um, but, but they're not really, you don't have to do a lot of retraining is, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, my work in indigenous communities, that is a whole other kettle of fish. I mean, when you look at it, indigenous communities are usually isolated. And, um, you know, Shalani, you've, you've worked with, uh, you know, you've done your work with poverty and things like that. And obviously these, these communities have a lot of um, uh, roadblocks and barriers. And so retraining them or putting them to work in, in, a, in a low carbon economy, 
uh, you're going to face much the same challenges that you would putting those workers to work in in more conventional energy. And so um, I know that the uh, the federal government has been doing things with uh, transitioning workers, uh, you know, encouraging Indigenous people to get into the trades and things like that, and they have supports for that, which is really good. But um, you're also now looking at, at uh, you know, just barriers to education, uh, criminal records, that kind of thing that, that sometimes occur in places like that. And so I think what needs to be done is, is some things need to be overlooked. Um, but you, you obviously can't overlook education. So that would, that would sort of push your question back to how do we, instead of how do we get these people to work in these sorts of jobs, it would be how do we eliminate poverty? How do we you know, level the playing field? How do we equalize it for everybody and make it fair for everybody? So, so it's, it's the same sort of question, but just, um, you know, there's, there's deeper answers there. There's no, there's no easy answer. But um, definitely we have to work toward level the playing field between, um, you know, less fortunate communities. Um, Ian, just because we're, we're making very good time, I'll just pose you another question based off of what uh, your response was. Something that uh, just made me think when you were talking about uh, the fact that there a lot of retraining doesn't actually need to happen. Um, it's probably a myth that uh, all a bunch of workers will get left behind uh, if, if all of a sudden oil and gas becomes divested and we start investing in more renewables. But do you think there's... Um, a good match between transitioning workers from oil and gas and fossil fuels to these renewable industry, um, to, to the workforce? Do, do renewable industry workforces require the same level of employment? Um, it, I don't know if that's making sense, but is there a good match between uh, actually transitioning people into this new industry? Uh, does it actually require as many people as um, as fossil fuels does, because I know I know uh, wind farms, for example, uh, don't require quite as many workers. So I, I don't know if you've done any work around this or have anything to say on that topic. Uh, yeah, I do, and and that's uh, that's a very good point. I mean, I think in twenty seventeen, I think or twenty eighteen, I'm not sure. I think uh, in Alberta here we lost over over a hundred thousand jobs, which is which is quite a lot, right? And um, it's, it's three years past that now. And, you know, the, uh, the work there, like I said, they're not booming. They're not doing a lot of expansions. I mean, people here were begging, or not, sorry, begging. They were hoping in Alberta that, uh, you know, we'd get one of those pipelines to either, you know, the West Coast or the East Coast or something, right? And, uh, you know, because they, they figured they could go back to work. Um, but a lot of people have unfortunately had to go into different lines of work. I mean, I know people that have transitioned to say car sales or insurance, or, you know, they just go back to school for, uh, you know, one of my friends who's an electrician is now studying to be a massage therapist, for example. And so there's, there's a big transition right now out of, um, and I don't want to make this just about Alberta, but, but there is a big um, transition of, of workers out of that right now. Um, and you're right, because because, uh, you know, working on a solar farm, it's, uh, I won't say it's like Lego, you know, but it's not as, as complex as, say, some of the systems that might be in an oil and gas refinery. So uh, the thing that I've noticed in, in this province, anyhow, is um, I think, uh, Carmen, you had mentioned earlier something about low-paying jobs. And, and I've noticed over the, over the past few years that there has been what, what in the industry they call it a, uh, a race to the bottom. And, uh, and that's in terms of wages. And that's right across the board. That's with all the trades. Um, the, the companies just seem to be paying less and less. And that makes it harder, obviously, for families to, you know, either make ends meet or, or that kind of thing. You know, if, if your salary was cut in half or a third kind of thing, then it makes it difficult if you have, uh, you know, two or three kids in school and you have a mortgage payment and cars and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I think what, like I, I mentioned earlier too, what, what needs to be addressed is uh, um, the changes other than just energy. I mean, one of the things that I think is, is important is uh, local food production. Um, you know, 75% of a barrel of oil goes into transportation. Um, that's, that's a statistic. And uh, if, if we start um, 
putting people to work in, in local food production, like healthy organic food kind of thing, that would, that would uh, contribute to uh, an increase of uh, the general health of the population because people are going to be eating more healthy now than less processed food. And, and uh, you know, if we don't have things shipped from across the ocean, then, then we can put people to work here. But, but definitely the, uh, the, the wage drop is, is right across the board. So I think that's going to affect people negatively over time. And uh, yes, I guess to, to, to answer your question, you definitely don't need as many workers in that industry. Um, all at once, you know, you work on one solar farm and you'll have a, a group of people. And when that's done, you go to the next. But you honestly don't see uh, at this point in time, anyhow, in Alberta, uh, you don't see the big expansions. I know there's a, a big solar farm planned for out near the International Airport, but um, you know, it'll take a number of people I don't know, maybe 50, 60 people or whatever. I'm not exactly sure, don't quote me on that. But, uh, but then when's the next job? You know, we're, we're not expanding. Like Canada has a population that's equal to the state of California. And, uh, you know, we, we, we just don't see those projects yet, which is unfortunate. Um, clean energy is fantastic, right? Like wind and solar and that kind of thing. Uh, battery storage is, is something that we have to, to work on, right? If we're gonna have that power all the time. And uh, um, that, you know, that's an important thing. But, but like I said, we have to look at where we can put workers other than just thinking about taking the oil and gas workers out of the, the refineries and putting them into solar farms because there's, there's so much more to, to clean energy and that low carbon transition than just um, going from fossil fuel to solar power. So I guess that's my answer. Thank you, Ian. That was very informative and insightful. Um, uh, let's move to uh, Shalini. So uh, I wanted to ask you, what is employment equity? Uh, and what would you say to individuals who are concerned that workplace equity hiring is becoming more important than hiring based on merit and qualifications? So especially um, amongst a lot of my white peers, this is definitely something that unfortunately uh, gets talked around about a lot. And it's, it's unfortunately very um, uh, stereotyped that workplaces are starting to hire based on diversity and not qualification. So um, I'll let you speak to that. Thank you so much, Emily. Th this is a pretty, I think this is a pretty tough conversation for people to have. You know, there are a lot of feelings and emotions that come up. And I've been through Color of Poverty advocating on employment equity for the past, I think, almost 20 years now. And, you know, we've seen a real reluctance from governments, private sector, to even take hold of the term employment equity, right? Uh, because of what you described, that, that feeling of somehow it being unfair. So I wanna really unpack that a bit, right? Uh, so really at its core, if you want a great definition of employment equity, it comes right out of the Federal Employment Equity Act, the legislation, right? So it's really an either a legislation or a policy or a scheme that encourages the establishment of working conditions that are free of barriers, right? It moves to correct the conditions of disadvantage in employment and promotes the principle that employment equity requires particular specific measure, uh, measures to accommodate the differences for designated groups who have faced historical disadvantage. So that's a mouthful, right? So really what it's about is creating fairness in the workplace. And when people rate, because it, it's raised all the time when I make submissions around well, what about merit? What about qualifications, right? That should be the driving force for employment, not sort of looking at historically disadvantaged communities and thinking about how to raise them up. So I would push back and say a couple of things, right? First of all, it's loaded in the idea that we think that people are hired based on merit and qualification now right? They're hired based on advantages and identity. They're hired based on gender. They're hired based on race. They're hired based on not having visible disabilities. They're hired based on not having a criminal record. They're hired based on nepotism. They're hired based on connections. I could go on. I could actually go on for another 15 minutes with all of the non-merit qualification reasons for why people are hired, right? And it's not just, you know, white people who do this. It's everybody 
right? This is a systemic thing. It's not an us and them. These are systems of disadvantage built into the labor force, and they're perpetuated by all of us because we're in that system. Much like when we talk about misogyny and patriarchy, if we live in those systems, much like when we talk about truth and reconciliation, right? As settlers, we're all part of the system that is creating the problem. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting and loaded way to phrase it to say merit and qualifications is more important than sort of looking at disadvantaged communities. Because if you flip it and push it back on someone and say, well, let's talk about advantaged communities. How long have you had advantage in Canada for hundreds and hundreds of years that have brought you to where you are, right? And so that advantage is something that employment equity seeks to either root out or extend to people who haven't had that same advantage for so many years. And so that's the first piece, right? I also think in that kind of comment, there's an, an, an implication that somehow hiring people from a certain disadvantaged community or community that's faced barriers, that person is less qualified, right? Um, there's sort of this uh, dichotomy between if you got hired under an employment equity program, you somehow weren't qualified. When the reality is, and I can speak even personally about myself, the reality is I was always equally, if not more qualified than a lot of the people applying for the same jobs as me, but I did not get those jobs for other reasons, right? And that happens to a lot of people. We know in a study in Ontario that people with Asian sounding last names are significantly higher rates of, uh, of have it being unlikely for them to even be called for an interview just because of their last name, right? And so we know that the idea that because you were hired through an employment equity process somehow doesn't mean that you're qualified is a myth. That's, that's just a falsehood. In fact, most of the people who um, come into workplaces under those programs, I would say are eminently qualified. Some aren't, some are, who knows, but that's really the reality of all employees, right? Um, and so it's a loaded question to, to sort of pit those two things against each other. And I think the other thing that is even trickier to think about is that idea of qualifications and merit right? And how do we define that in our in labor market, in our employment systems? And is there an underlying discriminatory way in which we even create merit and qualifications, right? Very easy examples are the foreign accreditation pieces that I spoke about earlier, right? At the South Asian Legal Clinic, we've hired three foreign trained lawyers so far in the number of years we've been here. And they uh, have on average had to take seven to eight years to have their credentials recognized in Ontario to practice law. All three of these lawyers were practicing at the Supreme Court level in their home country for years before coming here, right? But they were seen as people who were not qualified to practice law here. And so the idea of what we mean about qualifications also has to shift. I think about my partner's company where they looked at one of the qualifications for work as fit. And for them, fit meant they wanted people who knew how to play hockey. This was years ago. It's shifted now, right? But this was, this was like, I would say about 10 years ago. And um, the reality is if you really go back and dig deep into who was playing hockey at that time, it was certain communities, right? And other communities were not in that arena. And so really the unintended um, um, consequence of these fit qualifications that employers have is often to leave out groups that are disadvantaged in either getting those jobs or getting those promotions. And in Ontario, we're having a very intense conversation with racialized lawyers and the Law Society of Ontario about the continued barriers that racialized lawyers trained here continue to face in the justice system itself. And so those are all things, you know, that we need to think about when we think about sort of the counter argument to employment equity. So really in the end, I would actually argue that those who are focused on merit and qualification should actually be the biggest supporters of employment equity because the whole purpose of employment equity is to achieve equality in the workplace so that no person is denied employment opportunities or benefits for reasons unrelated to their ability. 
So in, in fact, I believe that employment equity actually aligns perfectly with the idea of hiring people on an equal basis, on an equitable basis based on ability. Thank you so much. That was such a such an amazing, succinct answer. That was a and you, I know. <laughs> no, but it was it was so. I mean, unfortunately, profound. To you know, it's sad to think that you know you have one community who's sort of benefited from the system and has just assumed that they have been getting their jobs based off their qualifications. But you you bring some great points. It's a lot of nepotism. It's a lot of networking and uh, having access to hiring managers because of status, because of gender, because of race. So these are all amazing points and points okay, that bring up to I, my friends. One that I forgot to mention was one that's not in the human rights code, but that I think should be, and that's socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which um, discrimination against low income people plays out in the labor market. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so now I have a question for Carmen. Um, so you've mentioned it uh, just in your introduction to yourself, but uh, can you both speak to some of the specific barriers that racialized people, newcomers, those with precarious status um, face when accessing employment? So maybe some very specific stories that you can bring forth to really, uh, you know, we, we talk about these barriers very broadly, but if you have any specific stories to bring forth from your own experiences or experiences in your community, um, and then sort of breaking off that point, some real mechanisms uh, that you can identify for workplaces, hiring managers, and employment services uh, that they can utilize to sort of erase these barriers. I know that's a very broad question, but uh, <laughs> I'll let you answer it. Okay, um, I can start with, um, first of all, I don't think I mentioned what um, my community is, and that is the Latino community. So as soon as um, we arrive into Canada, we have that language barrier. So the language barrier brings a, a number of different things. The first one would be um, that we can't communicate, therefore we can't be hired. Um, and then comes, well, you don't have the Canadian experience. Um, so we keep looking for work, but we can't speak the language, we don't have the experience. So these are really issues that, that are difficult to overcome. Then there's also um, the transfer credit eligibility, which I think uh, Shalini mentioned. Um, so let's say there's a doctor um, that comes from South America. Uh, they don't, you can't automatically be, be a doctor here in Canada. First of all, the language comes in into uh, also a, a barrier, but also um, the transferring of the university um, credits are not, you can't do it, you, like you can't be transferred automatically. So I have seen uh, doctors from South America just working as um, when they are able to actually do something like uh, something with their credits validates their, their diplomas in some way, in some small way. Um, they are ultrasound technicians or something like that. But so this is way below what they would be in, in, in a country where they would be accepted as, as, as a doctor. Um, I have specifically um, also seen dentists who have been unable to um, transfer their or validate their their diplomas and they've had to stay home uh, living off of social assistance and not having enough funds and one of the things that Latin American people do often is they they, they have to send money to their family in in South America because there's already a difficult situation in South America. So this also affects, affects them in a way um, that they're unable to sort of move forward to sort of get that being a little comfortable uh, economically um, because they're worried about their, their family and, and they need to send that money. So this affects them greatly. Um, 
also specifically in my own experience here in Canada, um, I came to Canada when I was five. So I don't normally have the language barrier because I started school here, but what happens in the schools and specifically in high school, many of the people of color who were going to high school and then they were by the, by the, um, uh, who, th those people that put you in, in, in the, um, in the, they put you in like the general course instead of the counselors put you in the general course instead of the advanced courses. So therefore, there's something happening there, the specifically racism. They put you in a place where you cannot get those better paying jobs, right? Because you're put in a place where you're at a disadvantage. So you're put in general courses so that you can't go to university. I mean, this specifically, this happened to me. That was my experience. Um, moving on. Um, it's, I think that one of the problems with the hiring and the working was the second question that you asked, is that expecting a newcomer to volunteer is really unfair. Because again, with the Latin American community, you're, you're hoping to make some money so that not only that you can survive, but also your family back home can survive. So they leave their children or they leave their elderly parents. They need financial support. And so if you expect them to be sort of um, volunteering to get that a Canadian experience, it's not, it's not realistic for, for them. So they end up just getting whatever they can get, a low paying job. And um, I'm not sure if I missed anything, but there's another experience about the specifically and at this time the precarious status people um there wasn't um if they didn't have any funds they weren't working a lot of the factories were closed uh during the the virus situation um they would not have been able to pay their rent therefore um i think homelessness occurred or um, they would have to just return to their country somehow. But um, specifically, there were families that I know that had it not been because their rent was lowered, they would not have been able to continue to live in where, where they are. And so I think that's all I'm going to say for now. Thank you. Um, this talk around uh, language barriers just sort of uh, brought to mind another type of language, which is the financial language. So though we don't often think of this financial language, and, and for those who are watching, I'm, I'm speaking about um, the language of tax systems, things like tax-free savings account, registered retirement savings plans, these tools that um, those with precarious status, newcomers, um, and those with precarious immigration status might not have access to, but even people who are second, third generation uh, newcomers and immigrants uh, might know about, but, uh, you know, these are such abstract terms that, you know, anyone in poverty often doesn't aren't aware of these tools that can really help them save money, um, help them invest, help them better their status. So even though this isn't directly tied to employment, I wonder if any of you have anything to say about the barriers, to not just languages like English and uh, your own languages, but the financial language of our, of our employment and tax systems and income. Uh, great point. And I think what's so interesting, you know, working at Salco for the past uh, 15 years, we meet, we, we work, I think, in direct service with about 6,000 clients a year. And many of them are not even newcomers to Canada and have absolutely no understanding of things like the RSP. I spoke to someone yesterday who has a child who's six and had no idea that she could apply for Canada Child Benefit, right? And so, 
Um, there are obviously barriers in terms of the way that we create financial literacy for people who are not even necessarily new to Canada, but um, people who are here from communities that don't feel as connected to um, those types of services, right? And so it's a really great point because all of that underpins their outcomes, even in terms of their labor market outcomes. Getting Canada Child Benefit, which could support with childcare, could have gotten that mom into the workforce in a part-time job if she'd wanted, right? And she was shocked. You know, she was shocked that she didn't realize it. And, it, and it's heartbreaking, right? I think uh, Carmen brought up a good point with... Uh... And I, I mean, obviously, I'm Caucasian, so I can't speak to the the um, discrimination that that people of color face or what have you. But I mean, the uh, the education system does seem to um, play a big part in this. And and so, if you consider, you know, people that go through high school that may not be uh, do so well in school, for example, um, you know, maybe they have ADHD or something, or or whatever, maybe an un undiagnosed issue or they just don't get the math or what have you. Um, the system seems to filter these people into um, more menial roles, you know, like they, they'd be encouraged at, at a high school level from a counselor to, to get a trade or become a painter or something like that. Whereas, you know, some people obviously would, if they have, you know, higher marks in school, they're, um, they're able to go to university and become an accountant or something like that. Um, so there is, um, I think it was like Albert Einstein or somebody said, if you, if you judge everybody on their ability to climb a tree, you know, fish are going to fail every time. Right. But it doesn't devalue the fish at all. Right. So, so um, this sort of harkens back though to our education system. And I mean, I'm even thinking back in, in school, they don't really promote uh, and, and this, this doesn't talk to anything about the newcomers, but, but um, they don't, they don't talk about financial literacy in school so much. They, they, you know, they, they go through the basics um, and you get your math, but, but uh, these sorts of things aren't taught in school. And maybe this is something that, um, you know, if we look at education reform, uh, financial literacy and self-sufficiency should be something that's taught to, to everybody. I mean, uh, I've heard they have, uh, I think it's called COM or something now, Career and Life Management. And it's an option for, for students to take if they want. And it, it does give them a bit of a accounting, like just keeping a basic household budget. But uh, maybe maybe we could have a look at the education system and see what we can do to, to make that available to everybody. And then when you're in school, you will have some knowledge on, on how to take care of your finances. Um, I remember in, uh, when I was much younger and I went to college and uh, the first thing, you know, I'm an I'm a 18 year old kid going to college and uh, I remember seeing postered everywhere on on the on the walls hey you're a student now come get a credit card and uh but they don't teach you about debt they teach you to spend right and so it's almost like this is by design right which is really unfortunate and um yeah that's 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 definitely a problem so yeah can i make one more point on the tax system piece um because colored poverty has been doing some interesting work with the taxpayer ombudsman at the federal level and what, they've, what we've discovered and what seems to be known now is that the algorithms used in the CRA tax system to determine audits are often picking up low-income people, low-income women, racialized people more than others. And so one of the interesting intersections with the tax system is that built into the tax system is already an unfairness towards all of the types of workers that all three of us are talking about, right? And so they don't have the means to fight back the way people like me could even fight back or a large corporation could even fight back and bury the CRA. And we were told actually that the, it is intentional that those types of clients are the ones they go after because they're the ones that they'll have a tick success on penalizing. And that conversation is now extending to CERB and the idea of all these people suddenly who um, collected the CERB when they shouldn't have and what should we be doing about penalizing people. So there's a sort of 
systemic problematic piece around our tax system as well that really then disadvantages low wage earners, part time earners, women, uh, people with precarious immigration status. Many migrant workers who pay into EI don't even get to collect out of it, right? So there are all of those added pieces. Um, I'd like to also say that specifically with my own experience, um, language wasn't a problem, but since we're talking about the financial part, um, I have not been able to buy a house. So, and it's been many years. Uh, it, I, I don't know what it is that it, it, it's so difficult. Um, I have been going to school for a long time. I took, I did all my studies for the past 10 years. So there wasn't much saving for us. I have three children. We're a family of five. And uh, right now, if my girls, they're a little older now in their 20s, if they did not work, I would not be able to rent a house for us. Um, so there hasn't been any savings. Why is it so difficult for me, my family, to be able to buy a house if, if there's, because we don't have the savings, there's always, you need that 5%. If you don't have that or the 10%, some places 20%. Um, this is, this is what, this is difficult. So that was my experience. That's a very good point. Thank you, Carmen. Um, it's, um, it's, it's really not just about how much housing costs, but having access to those saving mechanisms that at least let you save up enough for that initial down payment. And uh, I think as a society, we always sort of, um, you know, we support buying a house as the, the best financial decision you can make, but only such a, especially now, uh, only such a few sliver of society can actually even afford housing anywhere near any of the main municipalities. It's even extremely expensive in rural areas now. Um, and uh, I also like to want to just thank you because your your point about recent um, newcomers from Latin America having to uh, not really having access to save because they have to send money back home is actually what inspired that financial language question. So I want to thank you for that because that's a very good point that I think a lot of um, landed uh, sort of second, third generation and then settlers really don't have to struggle with is this idea of supporting family in another country. Um, okay, so uh, Natalie, does this bring us to our uh, open q and I suppose? Or do you want me, I can also ask, I have a few other questions I can ask. Uh, why don't we take a few questions that have come up in, in the Q&A and then we'll see kind of how we're at for time. Um, so I can read, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, so we have a question from uh, Alexandra. Hey, Alex. Um, I know she's with the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Um, she's asking if Shalini or other panelists could discuss the impact of emergency benefits in terms of those who are precariously employed. I mean, that, that's a great question. So there are a few pieces on all of those. So the federal emergency benefits um, still have a number of, of things that you have to meet, right, to qualify. And so um, right out of the gate, people who are undocumented uh, or with certain types of immigration status um, do not qualify for any of those benefits, right? And then those who are precariously employed, which can run the gamut from citizens through to people with temporary status who work in part-time or in gig economies, then you have to kind of parse through, do they make the insurable hours, right? So um, I think the government has, has tried, I'm going to give them credit for having tried to create programs that actually are as barrier free as they were, you know, thought they could be. I obviously think they could have been even more barrier free, but um, I think why it becomes confusing for so many people is because there is a laundry list of if this and this and that, right? And I've given a number of presentations over the past few weeks about the new recovery benefits that replace the CERB plus the enhanced EI. And every time they give a presentation, someone will ask me a question about a client with precarious work. And I will have to sit back and think that's exactly the type of person that won't get these benefits. 
And so the more people raise it, the more I realize that a lot of people are not covered by those benefits. And so I think it's a point I think that Ian made and Carmen's made too around um, poverty reduction is not always about these sort of these income security programs, especially ones run through the tax system because they don't reach a vast majority of the most vulnerable workers working in our in our country, right? And my view always, and I'm, prob I'm guessing that's the view of a lot of people when we're thinking about working with people, we're triaging, most vulnerable up, right? We triage in health, we should triage in terms of poverty and really try to design systems that lift up the people who are not being captured. So I think right now those recovery benefits, you know, they are going to be extended to a lot more people than our traditional benefits were, that's for sure. But I think they're not going to capture a larger group of people who, if we don't come up with something and those benefits stop, we're going to have a real concern with deepening poverty in those communities, deepening homelessness in those communities, deepening poor health outcomes. So we have to really think about, um, you know, when we talk about recovery, putting some teeth to that poverty reduction strategy that Ian referenced that is much larger than these kinds of recovery benefits. Thanks, Shalini. Does anyone else want to add anything? I might just throw something in there. Um, I just I just had an interesting thought. Um, my uh, parents were immigrants, right? So I'm technically a first generation Canadian, I guess. Um, but obviously, you know, with with uh, you know, I'm I'm I present as white or whatever. So you would never guess, right? But then you would, if you saw somebody of color, you might just assume that, oh, they're new. But, you know, so I see that disparity there, which is, which is unfortunate, right? Um, but the thing, the thing I wanted to point out was um, generations ago, uh, and this is um, um, what Carmen had said made me think about this. Um, I, I don't know, Carmen, if you are a single parent or not, like you mentioned, you had children, but, uh, um, but anyhow, so the, the issue that, that I was going to bring up is, is uh, in previous generations, you could have one parent working um, while the other parent would stay at home. Typically, you know, it was, it was the, the woman or the wife, I guess, or the mother, but um, you literally could have uh, one parent working full time and the other parent would stay at home and be the homemaker, take care of the children. The, the, the family could afford a home, you know, more often than not, they could have a little vacation spot for themselves and they could have, a, um, you know, vehicles and that kind of thing. So one of the things that's, that's the issue here is uh, alongside of, of uh, you know, an equal pay for equal work and that sort of thing and, and all the, you know, the tax issues that are against people is uh, the devaluation of the dollar. So, so I mean, our economic system here has, has really come a long way um, over, over several years. I mean, I did mention the, uh, you know, that thing that's turned the race to the bottom where the wages are actually dropping, um, you know, and taxes are going up and that kind of thing. And uh, $20 in the past would get you a shopping cart full of groceries, but now it gets you one bag if you're lucky, you know what I mean? And uh, so those are also deep issues that, um, that affect you know the, the the stuff we're talking about today too which is something that maybe could be looked at at, at some point thanks Ian. uh we have a question from carrie um and she says i'd like to circle back to the issue of green jobs a lot of research including by the international labor organization suggests that dollar for dollar investments in renewables and energy efficiency create or support more jobs in the current context, it's also important to consider the breadth of jobs that are low carbon, including healthcare, education, social work, and work in long-term care. Imagining for a moment that in building back, we can rethink the way our economy is organized, what opportunities might we have to simultaneously address the climate crisis and systemic barriers to employment by, justing, by justice-seeking communities? I will open that up to the panel. I guess that's <laughs> is unless anybody else wants to go, I can I can front that one. I guess. Um, 
I did, I think I did mention before that, that uh, when we look at, at uh, you know, a, a low carbon economy, it's not just taking oil and gas workers and building solar farms because that's not the solution. Um, yeah, we, we do need to look at, uh, if, if we're gonna do this right, um, we do need to look at more sustainable ways of doing things. Uh, circular economy is uh, is a buzzword that's that's been put out a lot. Um, you know, like uh, we we do we we live in a capitalistic society, and and capitalism does have a uh, a throwaway sort of mentality. I mean, I I know people that'll stand in line for an entire weekend to get the latest iPhone, and you know that sort of thing, right? And and uh, there's uh, there's been some class action lawsuits against some corporations, some some major corporations, because um, they don't allow their uh, their appliances or or that sort of thing, their their products to be uh, repaired. So we've we've built like a throwaway society, which is which is not sustainable. And there are so many things that that uh, that we could do as a society to become uh, green and uh, you know energy efficient and more sustainable. Uh, there's there's uh, there's definitely a lot of work out there for people with uh, uh, varying degrees or or I should say degrees of education or skill. Uh, not just yet, but in the future, like uh, Canada's transitioning. Uh, in 2020 to a new, new building code and it's going to be a net zero building code and what that means is your that any new building that's uh, put up has to uh, be able to provide its own energy and they have to be more efficient so there's you know 200 years of buildings in Canada right now that don't meet that standard so it, there will be jobs built for people to do retrofits for example um, and it's that's kind of a low uh, entry point a low skill level job to do things like uh, uh, tearing off siding, putting new insulation on, um, installing low uh, flow toilets, that kind of thing. So, so there are there are those sorts of jobs available. I did mention uh, local food production. That's one that's like really high on my list because I think uh, you know the overall health of the population is is quite low right now, and that's due uh, in in a lot of parts to um, basically what we put in our mouths, right? So there's a lot of environmental issues that can be addressed where we we can always do better um, and uh, like I said that that will help employ a lot of people but again the challenge is is uh, a lot of those jobs are, are uh, low paying jobs kind of thing so uh, that's that's unfortunate but um, I guess that's that's why we're here to talk about how do we how do we fix that I guess but did I, did I answer that well or did I miss any points Thanks, Ian. Um, and I'm just wondering if uh, if anyone else wants to add anything about what sort of um, standards or whether it's employment standards or regulations or investments we need to make sure that uh, that that these green jobs, particularly in um, in the care sector, um, whether that's healthcare or caring for others in, in other capacities, um, are are viable jobs. Um, again, recognizing that just because someone's working doesn't mean that's going to keep them out of poverty. Um, so wondering if, if either of you have anything you want to add about that. I think especially in the care sector, we have to talk about the gendered piece, right? The, the care sector is a, a very gendered sector, um, you know, with a high, uh, um, a high uh, percentage of women working in the sector. And we in Canada haven't done uh, well at all on the wage gap. Right, and so if we don't look at creating um, not minimum employment standards, but actually standards that rise those type of workers up to a, a livable wage, then they'll just continue to live in those cycles of poverty. And um, the thing I think that also we have to look at alongside that, going back to Ian's point about the whole approach is thinking about things like childcare and Carmen's note about housing, right? They all come hand in hand for the people who work in, in the care economy. And, and you know, even we didn't get to it today, but even those who are in the gig economy, right? And how are we going to make sure that employment standards extend to those types of workers? Because I know in the law, employers are fighting tooth and nail to identify a lot of those people as independent contractors and not employees to get out of, 
right? Extending those protections. So I think we have a lot of conversations around those sectors um, in terms of, um, you know, just because you're working doesn't mean we're, we're bringing you up out of poverty, particularly if we're not dealing with um, wage gaps and minimum employment standards for people who are otherwise not considered employees. If you don't mind, I would like to add something that uh, may not have to do directly with this, but we were discussing it. Um, Ian mentioned that before with $20, you could, you know, have a sort of a lot of groceries. But I think that with the low paying jobs, um, I remember that um, um, it is my husband and myself and three children. They were quite young and we just had $50 a week to do grocery shopping. So we, I had to sort of do miracles um, so that my children can have enough vegetables, fruits, and, and different types of like meat uh, items. So we ate a lot of chicken. So my point is um, that this also affects our health. So if there isn't enough money, if you don't have a good job, you're not going to eat properly or be able to buy the things that you really need. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And um, I wasn't able to put a question in the Q&A because I'm the host, but I'm going to uh, abuse my powers to put in my own question. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's building off what, um, what you have just been speaking about. But um, in addition to um, government created programs and, and benefits and, and things like this to support, uh, whether, whether it's supporting workers through transitions or in times of unemployment or uh, increasing their access to employment opportunities. I'm wondering if any of you would like to speak to what sort of industry regulations you'd like to see brought in so that we're ensuring that the private sector is also doing their fair share. Um, we hear a lot when we talk about a just recovery, making sure that uh, corporate bailouts, for example, actually benefit the workers and communities um, affected by those industries. So I'm just wondering if, um, if you'd like to share some thoughts on the kinds of um, responsibilities that, um, that employers and, and private industry need to take on themselves. I mean, I always have lots of thoughts, <laughs> but I feel like I'm taking up a lot of space, Ian, Carmen. I, I was in the same boat. I didn't want to go first because I didn't want to be all in everybody's face. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll just briefly go. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a big issue. Uh, with you know corporations and and uh, the the bailouts and things like that. I mean, we all of us have are we're old enough that we lived through the the uh, um, the housing uh, crisis in the U.S. in the 2007, 2008, 2009. And uh, I remember watching all of the uh, uh, the quantitative easing that uh, uh, President Obama was was giving out to Wall Street, and uh, you know it was is big corporate bailouts and. Uh, the whole the whole concept of the trickle down effect it doesn't really seem to work um, you know you get you get these big um, and and i would I would never begrudge anybody um, to make as much money as they possibly could if if that's something that they want to do and earn a lot of money and be wealthy and things like that go for it kind of thing that's up to you but um, but it's still when when you go back in in history so the early twentieth century you would have a corporation. Uh, and the owner of the corporation would be would be making on average, I think it was seven times what the factory floor worker would make, right? And um, so that's if if you were making ten dollars an hour as a worker, the owner of the company is making seventy dollars an hour, kind of thing. Um, and there's there's not too much disparity there. There there is a, a you know it's obviously seven times, but um, when you look at today. The uh, you know these executives are making 400, 600, a thousand times what the factory floor worker is making, and I read a really interesting report um, uh, a few months ago, and it, it it sort of outlined what the um, 
it, it said an average worker makes, I think it was between 40 and $70,000 a year or something. And then it showed what the CEOs and, uh, and, and top executives of, of uh, some corporations in Canada, how long it takes them to make that. And some people make that in 20 minutes or some people make it before lunchtime, you know, and they do that every single day. Whereas the other person has to work for an entire year to make that $40,000. So there's, there's definitely a lot of disparity there. Um, and I think to, to move ahead, we need to, um, we need to have a little bit of a, a kind of like a reset. I mean, I know, I know with uh, Curb right now, and there's, there's a whole, a whole pile of debt in the, in the country. And actually there's debt around the world right now because uh, the federal governments have borrowed money of each respective country to pay these, these curb payments. And, uh, you know, so they're going to be indebted quite a bit. And a lot of people are, uh, you know, I've heard people talk about, oh, we're going to a, uh, a Great Depression kind of thing. And, and, and that would be horrendous to think about living through that because people have done that in the past and it's a horrible thing, but it does create uh, a reset. So I'm not advocating for a forced reset like that, but I mean, I think it would be uh, good to see companies rise up now, like, like uh, startups and things like that, that would uh, think about getting into this, this uh, new low carbon economy or, or green jobs or that kind of thing where um, the, the companies are more ethically minded. You know, we have giant corporations like uh, Procter & Gamble and things like that, that, you know, annually hand out billions of dollars to their shareholders. But if we could, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that can be done and it's more of a grassroots, um, grassroots solutions, I guess. I mean, one of the things that Carmen had mentioned was, was um, you know, not being able to eat healthy food. And that's obviously a big challenge. It's, it's a big issue in uh, inner city homes where you have kids that, that live in poverty and then they go to school and uh, they don't eat enough to pay attention. So how do you expect them to go, you know, to do well in school, right? So it sets them up for failure, right? Um, so, so grassroots things might be making uh, community gardens, right? And uh, I, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that Shalani had talked about uh, today was uh, a lot of government-oriented stuff with, with uh, benefits from the government and, or, or uh, assistance or things like that, like government-funded programs. And uh, we kind of, in, in my opinion, I think we rely too heavily on, on those sorts of things, right? We, we, we form a dependence on that and we, we need to have the, you know, the whatever benefit, the child tax benefit or what have you to, to supplement us and we wait for that. Um, and it's, it is, it's definitely a necessity for a lot of people. Um, so I, I'm not downplaying that, but I think if we did things like, say I said, like community gardens or something or, or, or um, you know, people from the Latin American community, when they, when they, they come here, they can band together and, uh, you know, form cooperatives and, and uh, help each other out kind of thing. And I think we need, not just for, for Latin America, that was just an example, but I think as, as communities as a whole, we do need to go back to more traditional ways where we had, you know, backyard gardens and that kind of thing to supplement our food. Um, and, uh, you know, just like I said, go back to, to more ethically minded small businesses. Um, you know, Walmart, for example, everybody goes to Walmart to get whatever they need, but, uh, what, if you remember back to a time before Walmart, there were a lot more mom and pop shops around. You know, you'd go to the butcher, you'd go to, uh, you know, the sand store, whatever, to get some clothes and things like that. You go to the grocer or, or sorry, the, uh, um, the baker, that kind of thing. And, and all of these uh, small businesses would employ local people. And uh, typically, you know, the, the business owner wasn't making billions of dollars. But uh, he was employing local people and, and uh, there was more of a sense of community and family and that kind of thing. And uh, I think transitioning back to that as we, as we uh, decarbonize, I guess, would, uh, I think would, would benefit uh, us in a lot of ways. Like the, the corporatism that's, that's uh, prevalent in the world today, I think, has a, has a detrimental effect. And, and uh, you know, when you look at, at carbon, uh, sorry, climate change, uh, in, in Canada, for example, the they give you the statistic that per capita, you know, we pollute so much, but you can't tell me for a second that somebody in an under, underprivileged uh, community or an indigenous community kind of thing is, is, uh, has the same carbon footprint that of somebody who's, you know, wealthy kind of thing. 
And so, um, you know, we do have to keep those sorts of things in mind. And I think, oh, I guess I said to repeat myself, if we go back to, to smaller, smaller um, businesses, uh, tighter communities, you know, being friends with your neighbor, sharing that kind of thing, that will go a long way to, to helping people overall. Um, and, you know, obviously you can eat if you're, if you got, uh, you know, a good garden in your backyard kind of thing. But if you're an apartment, you don't have a backyard then you know you might have to go to the empty lot across the street and work together with your neighbors to, to grow a garden sort of thing. So um, just a couple of thoughts, I guess. Can I just add to what Ian said about the private sector? Because I think, yeah, I think a lot of advocacy is always focused on government being the solution for everything, um, and it's not. Um, I think a couple of things that I would be very interested in is that the corporate sector has had um, the same amount of bailouts um, in terms of wage subsidies, rent subsidies um, during COVID-19. Uh, and I'd be very interested in seeing how they've paid that forward to their workforces and their employees because I don't think they have, right? And what we um, are seeing is that there are extremely large corporations in this country who have benefited and profited from this pandemic, right? And um, Though, and it'll be now interesting to see what obligations are going to be placed on them to put that money back into those communities that Ian was talking about, right? And also, I think we're still failing on employment standards. None of those corporate, like across the country, the idea that we have to create a, a benefit at the federal level for paid sick leave um, for people who get sick at work is ludicrous. Like it, the responsibility lies with these private companies to provide that benefit. Um, they glean a lot of money from their employees. And so, and the other piece that makes me furious is the lip service that we've heard from these corporations after the death of George Floyd about systemic racism and diversifying boards. And, you know, I'm not going to swear, but I'm thinking it in my head, but now put your money where your mouth is. Either we get employment equity legislation on the table because we've given companies in this country a long time to get this right, right? And it hasn't happened. And so, um, you know, the pandemic has created a real highlight of all of those disparities. We keep hearing that over and over again, but at some point, corporations in Canada need to start moving forward on wage gaps, on benefits for employees, on trickling down their um, uh, profits, especially during a pandemic, and all of the, the corporate welfare that they took from the government, and are they hiring those people back? So. Those are all things that I think we have to think about. Um, I just wanted to say something. Um, I think that Canada has a lot of laws and rules in place to sort of help prevent um, poverty, racism. Um, but I think that one of the things that could be done is sort of educate the people. So, for example, um, I really like what the United Church of Canada is doing with their um, anti-racism workshops. It's part of uh, the work that I do. So, is there a way to sort of, if we would provide the education, I think that this would also help. It's not going to do away with everything, but it would also help uh, sort of change people's views and for me, it's, it's always, I always say that, you know, let's start with the children. Um, even if the parents are sort of teaching their children racism, they could get a different perspective at a school or at, you know, wherever else they sort of um, are in, 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 their, in their journey, like in, in life. And, and this would sort of, you know, help us out a little that when the person that is hiring um, and has various candidates, it's not going to look at, well, what's the color of the person, but instead we'll look at their qualifications because, you know, he has already taken this anti-racism. It's not going to solve everything. I'm not saying that it's going to solve everything, but, you know, it, it just could be of some help. Thanks, Carmen. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, we need to recognize that there's education to be done uh, internally for each of us to think about how we internalize these systems of oppression. 
um, and um, and how we embody that change that we want to see and um, you know the same changes that we're asking for for government to to do and um, to hold government accountable to um, we want to make sure that each of us individually and in our own organizations and the not-for-profit sector is certainly not exempt from this um, that we are doing this work um, ourselves and and making sure that the way we do our work is in line with these principles of equity and anti-oppression. Um, I want to use one final question from one of our attendees from Alice to kind of segue into uh, a little bit of information about our Chew on This campaign. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for uh, all the insight uh, that you've brought and the, the great comments that you've shared with us today. Um, we know that um, jobs and, and labor is just one um, one part of the solution to addressing poverty in Canada and the underlying systemic inequity. And we have a question from Alice about, uh, she says, your analysis and recommendations are precise and I find them being repeated in many sectors. What stops our collective from enacting these basic things? Is it a lack of political will? Is it the capitalist system that does not need to respond to these needs? A system in fact that produces disparity as a byproduct of wealth? And so um, because we're getting close to time here, I just want to take this opportunity, Alice, to use your question to kind of shift us into uh, looking at some of the ways that we can take action. Because I think, um, as you've said, like these problems are not new. Uh, we're not just discovering that these problems exist. Um, and the solutions that we're proposing are also not necessarily new. I think we're getting better uh, at refining those solutions and looking at how they fit in different contexts. But, um, you know, a, a lot of these uh, problems and, and answers have been around for some time. So I think your question about the lack of political will is really spot on. And I think if anything, the, the response to the pandemic has shown us that when there's a will, there's a way. And for all these times that we've been told that there's not enough money to do this or that, or we couldn't possibly afford this or that, well, all of a sudden, when um, people who were otherwise well off and working in good jobs could no longer do that and needed the government's help, well, there it was. So why don't we feel that people living in poverty deserve that same urgent response? So um, the Chew on This campaign, which uh, is hosting this series of webinars, um, is all about seeking justice for people experiencing poverty and other intersecting forms of systemic oppression. So I just want to draw your attention uh, to the campaign for a second, uh, share a little bit about um, our asks, what we're asking government to do to make a difference in terms of poverty in Canada, and to uh, show you how you can take action yourself. So I am going to, um, I'm going to sh share my screen just really briefly with you. Um, to, sh to show you a little bit about the campaign. Um, and um, I encourage each of you to check out the website afterwards, uh, send a letter to your MP, um, send a letter to the local editor, register for our e-rally. There's all different ways that you can take action this week leading up to October 17th, which is the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. So I'm just gonna quickly share my screen with you now. I'll just take a second here. So um, our campaign asks this year, we're developed in consultation with, uh, with some of our panelists today actually, and, and other, um, other members of other communities and organizations. And um, in the past, our campaign has, all, has focused on calling for a national strategy or a national plan to end poverty in Canada that is based in human rights and that is comprehensive in nature. Um, when the government released their poverty reduction strategy in 2018, we kind of pivoted a little bit and, um, and this used to be a postcard campaign. So when the pandemic hit, we, have to shift, we had to shift our engagement strategy as well. Um, so this year our asks and our actions have changed slightly, but at the core, this is still about um, honoring the rights and dignity of people experiencing poverty and other forms of oppression and making sure that we as a civil society make sure that our government knows that we demand action and that we are going to hold them to account for what they've already committed to. Um, and they're, they're 
moral and legal obligations. So this year for our asks, we really focused in on um, so the underlying systemic oppression, which you've heard about um, today in terms of how it affects people's uh, employment opportunities and, uh, and outcomes. So our first ask is that the Government of Canada fulfill their legal obligation to protect people's rights to an adequate standard of living, which includes employment standards and regulations, which includes food security, which includes housing as a human right, all these different things. Uh, and that we commit to ending poverty in Canada by 2030. This is an achievable goal. Um, poverty is pervasive and systemic, but it is not inevitable. It is the result of policy choices. And this goal would be consistent with our international human rights obligations that Canada has already ratified and uh, also consistent with the sustainable development goals. So that's our first goal. In order to do that, we recognize that because poverty disproportionately affects certain communities who experience systemic oppression, we need specific targets to end poverty within these communities and to improve other measures of well being and equity among these communities specifically. Um, you can see if you click on our website, um, you can get more details below about some of the specific communities that this includes. Um, and we also recognize that these targets need to be developed in consultation and collaboration with these communities uh, and that they should at minimum meet our human rights obligations, that they should at minimum meet the requirements of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and Indigenous Sovereignty uh, and the Sustainable Development Goals as well. So we need specific targets for these uh, particular communities. We have a, a national poverty line and we have measures about the rates of poverty in Canada, but that really masks the unique experiences of different population groups and particularly when we consider intersecting forms of systemic oppression. So we've already heard today about how it's not just about whether someone is black or female or living with a disability, but that these identities overlap. Uh, so thirdly, our, our last ask is that once we've set these targets, we need to make sure that we're prioritizing funding for strategies that reduce poverty and improve equity among these communities. And um, so to do that, again, we need the data to know how we're doing. We need disaggregated data that looks at who is experiencing poverty, who is being impacted by policies and laws that we've heard about, for example, with the recognition of foreign credentials. Um, who is actually able to access the benefits that we have, who's being left out. Um, again, this all has to be done in, in, with meaningful consultation and collaboration with the specific communities involved. Um, and they need to be part of the decision-making process in terms of how we design these policies and programs, how they're implemented, how they're monitored and how they're evaluated so that there's ongoing accountability. Um, and again, that these strategies encompass our tax system, they encompass our healthcare system. Uh, so they include these universal publicly funded programs and, and, and tax system, but they also need to include uh, community led, community specific strategies on a local level as well. So that the people who are most affected by these policies, the people that are living in poverty themselves and experiencing this kind of systemic oppression, they are the experts, they know what, uh, what they need um, to improve their lives meaningfully. So we need to make sure that we are funneling resources, that we're building those relationships, building in those accountability mechanisms so that they can actually um, design solutions that meet their needs. So those are the three asks kind of um, in general and the ways that we are uh, encouraging people to take action. Uh, you can see we've got a link, you can write a let send a letter to your MP, We've got a really handy tool that you can just fill in your information um, and it magically knows who your MP is. Um, and then you can, so that's with this form on the website here that I'm just gonna show you how, look how simple that is. You can edit this letter if you'd like to. Um, alternatively, you can download and print physical copies of the letter or you can order printed copies. They're available in English, French, and in Nuktatut. So particularly thinking of those without access to digital technology or internet, this is um, a great way that um, you can reach those, those folks as well. Um, there are also tools to send a letter to uh, local editors of local papers. Um, and we have our e-rally coming up on Saturday. 
Um, also, um, with, uh, with thanks to you for attending this webinar, we have a whole webinar series that you can check out. So there's all kinds of things on our website. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, but um, we're really excited to, um, to, to see all of you on the webinar and we hope that you'll share this within your network so that we can show the government just how much support is out there for taking meaningful, ambitious action. And um, so I, uh, I recognize we're just running a little over time here. So I just want to, uh, to thank our panelists and Emily, our moderator, um, for your time today and your contributions. Um, if, uh, if folks want to um, check out the links in the chat above, um, you, can, you can do that. Or I'm gonna pop my email in the, uh, in the chat. So if people wanna follow up with questions, they can do so. Um, but thank you for your time with us. Um, and I'm just gonna ask if anyone has like really brief closing remarks that they wanna share, um, feel free. And otherwise we'll, we'll say thank you and till next time. Thank you everyone, this was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you everyone. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, the Chew on This website is in the chat there. Please check it out. Please send letters. Please spread the word. And um, together, let's, let's really push for some meaningful changes. So thanks for your time. And uh, we wish you all the best. Thanks so much.